about three or four years ago, that I got onto this idea of top of mind mindset. And before I get into explaining this, that it was this time in it, when we were starting ICO, it was like two or three people, it was Kelsey, Brent, myself, and maybe one other person. And we went to this event, and I tried to create opportunity for myself uh, for the company, and it was just so hard. I felt like the last kid picked in dodgeball. Has anybody ever felt like that, where you're the last kid, you're like, there's a cool crowd? That's what I felt. And I, and I went home to my wife, and I remember having tears in my eyes because it just, I was like, this isn't going to work. I mean, like, it's just not going to happen for me. And uh, the company, I just know, don't know what we're going to do. And, and that's a life of trust barriers. It sucks. Um, and that's where I got on to this, this idea of this top of mind mindset because I think it's one of the single best ways to get past trust barriers, whether you're dealing with people, a company, um, any t anything that you can do to naturally gain trust and then stay on someone's minds very consistently, it's going to bring opportunity to you. So <laughs> this is slide. I don't know why my staff put Bill Murray in the rock because I, like, I certainly don't like it's not like I want to be them. It's kind of weird, but, it's a, but if you get the point is that there, when I'm talking about this, I want to create a magnet mentality. So when you're trying to stay on top of people's minds in a way, you want to bring people to you. It's this natural magnet. And back when I was at that event feeling like I was the last kid picked in dodgeball, there was this really cool you know, moment where there was someone that kind of, you know, I, I, that I had a relationship with and they let me in and it felt so good. And then just knowing that person, there was natural things that happened to me afterwards. And so what I try to create is this magnet. Um, and what we do, we call this in the marketing world is inbound marketing. Are you guys familiar with inbound marketing? Cool. Okay. And so I was on a plane, uh, it was about six months ago, and somebody said, okay, so what is the basics of this idea when you're talking about staying on and on top of people's minds? How does it relate to content? Like, how does it relate to content marketing? Uh, he had actually seen me speak, and he goes, how is your company taking off the way it, the way it is? And it's simple. When you put trust plus to stay on top of mind, natural opportunities will come to you. That's the simplest form of what I'm going to talk about today, but um, when you break down trust, these are some of the things that involve trust in my mind. Um, there's brand, there's likability, there's familiarity, education, helpfulness, authenticity. Um, I probably won't get into every single one of these today, but um, I call these trust, trust, touch, or trust touch points. When you are interacting with a company, with a brand, with a person, if you naturally do one of these things, you gain trust. And so to break it down, authenticity, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, every night I watch Aladdin. Um, that sounds super creepy and weird, but I honestly do. I have a three-year-old daughter that wants to watch Aladdin every single night. And there's this moment that, I don't know if you guys remember this, but when Aladdin is trying to act like a prince and the genie's like, be yourself. And, and I look at my daughter during this part, a couple times she just is naturally, she gets so frustrated with him. She's like, my three-year-old daughter gets pissed off and it's so cute. And I'm like, how does a three-year-old sense authenticity? Like she knows he's being crappy. And whether you're a three-year-old or you're a 30-year-old or a 50-year-old, it doesn't matter. All demographics, they've, we're naturally drawn to authenticity. So it's very important that whether it be in content, journalism, whatever, that we're maintaining that authentic, um, that, that authentic content. So here's an example. I wrote in uh, my Forbes column, How I'm a Terrible Writer. Uh, it's not a lot of people who are running fast-growing content marketing firms are going to say they're a terrible writer. I'm not. I consistently work on it. I'm always challenged. I go through. I, fortunately, I'm surrounded by some of the most talented people in editing, journalism, writing, and things like that. But um, I do have uh, things to share. I do have experiences, and that's where um, you know when I look at me being authentic. I don't want to act like I'm the best writer. I'm not because other CEOs will look at me and be like, "This guy's full of crap." Um, so I wrote about this, and this article actually did really well, specifically with. Um, a, a, target audience, a target audience of ours, which is CEOs. They go, man, like, I'm not an amazing writer. What do you do? And I go, great, like, here's what we do. And it actually gave me an opportunity to have a real relationship with quite a few people that could relate to me. So a lot of people wouldn't do that. I, I wanted to. Um, another good example that I give is that who, uh, who here knows Jeff Jones from Target, the CMO? Anybody know him? Okay. This guy is a really amazing leader. Um, when, t when Target was under basically scrutiny last year, they were really struggling. Jeff Jones just goes, you know what? I'm just going to tell people we're struggling. I'm just going to transparently write exactly what's going on with Target right now. Went on LinkedIn, published an article, and it was, it was called The Truth Hurts. You guys can look it up. It's, it's Truth Hurts in, in Google. Um, and uh, 
it was it, it actually I was naturally drawn to it because it was really like guys we suck right now and we're trying to get better and I was like man this is awesome I have, I connected I actually found myself in a target just feeling like happy for some reason it's kind of weird but um, to be honest I, I talk about that moment with Jeff because when I uh, I don't know Jeff well but people who know him well they said that like he was just honestly just trying to tell the truth on what was really going on. And that was a way where it was kind of a mix between content marketing and journalism that really, really helped that target brand. It went viral, went all over the place, I think 400,000 views the first day. Um, and so that's a good example of authenticity. And this is just something I put in here. Uh, I, I try and do this in my everyday communication, not just in writing, but I want to show you, this is, this is somebody who I met at an event, and they didn't respond to me. They said we're going to do all this great business together, and then after 20 follow-ups, they didn't respond to me. So I just said, you know what? I'm just gonna respond like I would just me just being me. And so I come up with a, just a funny little thing. I said, after quite a few emails, I thought I'd share my bucket list with you this year in an effort to get a call set up. John's bucket list. Have a sit down with Justin Bieber about where his life is going. Play and be, and actually, that, this was a while ago when I did that. He's actually turned some stuff around, so I'm pretty proud of him. But um, uh, NBA Jam with Oprah. Watch No Book Without Crying. That's completely legit. Um, get a call to set up before 2016 with, the guy's name was Rick. He responded to, and then I go on to say, I don't think one, two, and three are going to be a problem, but four is the one that really worries me. Could you help me out? He responded within 15 minutes. Responded, and we're doing business with him now. That was just, I was just kind of taking, I, was, I remember uh, before I uh, wrote that email, and I was thinking about how I, I want to be more authentic in my content, but also in my communication. That was just me just being me. I'm kind of a goofy guy. And uh, it worked out well. Helping others. This is something I can talk about a lot. This is one of the most meaningful things for me because it makes me feel the best. But this is something, like a lot of people have asked me um, how we, we've had so much success in media. Uh, for example, with relationships with some of the top publications in the world. I, all I've done is I've taken, er, and, and it's not me, it's, it's my team as well. Um, all we've done is we have taken this Midwest mentality, this Columbia mentality, to treating people well, helping others. That's something that's in the Midwest. In New York, LA, San Francisco, a lot of the places that I travel a lot, it's not as common. And so we took that, and that's how we've been able to form a lot of relationships. Uh, somebody just said, oh, you, you write for Inc. And I was like, yeah, great, love. And, and I knew quite a few of the editors there. And they said, how do you know that person? And I was like, well, actually, we, we first, we kind of met each other here. And then she was about to have a baby about the same time as you know, my wife was going to have a baby. So I went on her registry, and we uh, ordered a couple small gifts, wrote a personal note, and said, just, you know, I'm going through this, too, and I'm so excited that you are. I had no agenda, like, I want you to basically do something for me in the future. At that point, it was like, I'm actually excited for it because I'm having a kiddo, too, and, and I'm pumped. And, uh, and, you know, obviously that relationship has, has turned out to be a very good one. And so there's a lot of things with helping others. That's a, a gift-giving example. But, for example, um, share, uh, recognizing people. This is something we don't do often. If we're going to stay on people's mind in a very natural way, we want to do good things for them. And uh, for example, LinkedIn, I'm doing a web webinar with them tomorrow. Um, my initial uh, relationship with LinkedIn happened because I had a very good experience with one of their PR people. And I wrote a, a letter or an email to their, several of their execs and said, I just had a great experience with your PR person. It was amazing. I thought you, I, I really, I'm just going to be a, a LinkedIn fan person moving forward because it was so easy to deal with them. And uh, they got the stats. They were just awesome to deal with. Anyway, I found out later on uh, the person ended up getting a promotion. A lot of fun, fun things happened from that. And it sparked a, I guess, move, I guess you could say a domino effect that resulted in a, a quite, a, quite a lot of opportunity for my company. And that was just simply me just recognizing them. There's a lot of things, and like I said, I can go into a lot of uh, transparent feedback. I'll hit on it really briefly. This is something that I've learned. I used to BS people all the time, and I still honestly do occasionally. But giving transparent, <laughs> giving transparent feedback is something we should all do more often. I spoke at a, a FASCO event with, um, and then afterwards I ran into, uh, who's heard of uh, Twitch here, Justin TV? Anybody? So Justin TV, uh, it, I mean, it sold for almost a billion, basically. And Justin was speaking before me. He came up to me afterwards, and he said, man, this, this speech went awesome. Uh, what did you think about it? And everybody's like, Justin, you're awesome. I'm your fanboy. I want to be you when I grow up. And I just sat there, and I was like, it wasn't that good. Like, it really wasn't. I honestly just felt that way. And I, I said, I, I, I've seen him speak before, and I think he's actually pretty amazing. But I just go, man, dude, you talked about so, like, you weren't really thinking about the readers at all in the, in the audience. And when, like, I talked to him, and he goes, at first he was like, ugh, that sucks to hear. But I was just real with him. I was like, this is my honest feel, uh, take on it. Anyway, next thing you know, um, 
uh, I get a text from him and he's like, hey, you should come out, my friend's birthday party ends up being Alexis Ohanian's birthday party and then I'm in a room where I'm like, okay, I don't know how I got in this place, but this is kind of exciting for me. And um, I try to live by that, whether it be through you know, giving f pe people feedback on an uh, article. If they said, hey, what do you think of this? I, I don't want to tell, I don't want to falsify things. I just want to tell people the truth. And a lot of opportunities, as simple as that is, giving very transparent feedback when it comes to the content world is very valuable. Likeability. This is something um, I just recently added in this just because it's very fresh on my mind where whether you're dealing with, whether you're a journalist, whether you're a content marketer, whether you're a brand, likability is a huge, huge factor. If people like your brand, even if you screw up, they will not talk crap about you. Like, if you really like someone, are you gonna talk poorly about them? No, you don't. Even if you had a bad experience here or there. And if you really like someone and you have a good experience, it's amazing what can happen as for, for them to be a brand advocate. So this is something, um, I, uh, this was a realization point. I used to have a man crush on Mark Cuban. Anybody been there? Huge man crush on Cuban, or is it just me? Okay, this is just me. Um, but I actually, uh, I attended his birthday a couple years ago, and the one question that I asked, I only had about 20 minutes of time with him, but the one question I asked is that, how do you deal, you, like, how do you deal with this kind of question of likability? Because th this is just a struggle for me, because I look at two ends of the spectrum. I look at Paul Rudd. Yeah, who, or if you guys saw the Super Bowl commercial, Paul Rudd was actually identified as like one of the most likable people uh, out there. Like anybody hate Paul Rudd here? Nobody hates Paul Rudd, see, exactly. Um, and uh, then on the other hand, I, he does not know that he's in this, in this speech, but Matt Clark, he's my uh, old high school English professor. And he made me read 50 books in a year. I did not like him at all, uh, he, he sucked. Uh, but over time, I, like in that class, I remember I was like, God, I respect this guy. He made me read some of the best classics, and without that, like, I just wouldn't be there. And, and I have so much respect in him. And what I've learned is that the, the thing that Cuban told me is like, there's a balance between these two things. And I try and be in the middle. And even though it's, it's, it's a fight, it's not just me, it's my company, it's employees, because whoever deals with you, when you talk about collaboration, likability is huge. If you like somebody, you're going to do more with them. And so, what I would challenge you guys is that. Um, I go around and actually, uh, Jeff Hayden's a fellow columnist at Inc. He wrote a list and I looked at this list and I saw that, I was like, man, I do about half of these things. So I looked at this and I said, if I, and I told this to my employees, I said, look at this. I looked at this and I'm less than 50% of, and I agree with every single one of these things that he said. And I was less than 50%. That is a self-awareness, that's a self-aware situation where you're like, you know what, I need to get better. And so um, I challenge you guys, like look at, you know, make a uh, list of the qualities you find in a likable person because this is, is, it's very, very viral. Once people deal with you, like your employees, the people around you, you're collaborating with whoever, it is, it's a spread effect. And so I challenge you to do the same as well. Um, brain and thought leadership. This is something kind of, I mean, this is kind of the wheelhouse of my company, but what I would challenge you guys is that your brand is one of the big, whether, you, whether you're in any position, your brand is one of the biggest things that you have. It's one that's gonna create opportunity for you. If people are familiar with your brand, there's credibility that surrounds your brand, um, whether it be an individual or a company, there's just natural trust barriers that go away. And so you've gotta invest in your brand. You've got, whether it's a company, whether it's a person. Uh, I'm doing the, the webinar with LinkedIn tomorrow where I was just going through a bunch of people that don't even have a LinkedIn profile. For me, when people, I think it's 80% of our clients look at my LinkedIn profile before they sign on with us. That's a huge deal. So it's not just affecting me, it's affecting my company as well. So that sort of thing, your brand does matter wherever you deal with, whoever you deal with, whatever company you're with, whatever organization you're with. So, um, so a lot of times people are like, where, well, where do we start with, you know, how do I start with branding and you know, getting the, con the right content in front of people? Everybody here is a researcher. I'm a researcher. I'm always talking to different people and finding out different challenges they have, different sales barriers, aha moments where somebody's like, man, like just in this speech, I noticed where like Keith's like, yeah, that made sense. He's like, he's nodding and he's like smiling. I'm, I'm taking notes of that because I'm like, I need to say more of that. Like you can tell that people naturally engage with that. You should start doing that no matter who you deal with. I keep a topic bank of things that people just engage with. And I'm like, you know what? This person, like I talked to you afterwards, I'm like, he really liked, what's your name? Hi, Cole. Uh, but uh, Cole, for example, he says, hey man, this is really interesting, this part of the speech. And I'm like, cool, I need to do more of that. I'm always researching stuff, because when it comes to content, brand journalism, whatever you're doing, the, a lot of times people think that they need to go hire a censure for it or something. You don't, 
honestly. Yeah, I mean, at some point, I, since you're, I've got friends that are sometimes hire them. But in a lot of cases, with research, the best researchers are the people who are involved in the company. And I tell my sales staff, I'm like, you guys are the best researchers we have. And so it's very important that you, content triggers are starting to be aggregated, not just by you, but the people around you. Okay, so the rise in content marketing, this is a, a fun example that I want to uh, I share with a lot of people is that my wife is one of the um, best content marketers that I know. She's amazing. Uh, she, she works at Veterans United here and knows nothing about content marketing, but she does it all the time. And so we, have a me we had a meeting like once a month where we work on how we can make each other happier. And at one of those kind of wine nights, we called them, she said, um, you know, I wish you cooked more. And I go, really, out of all the things that I could do more, cooking came to mind. I'm like, it could be a lot of things that I could do better, but cooking, cool. Okay, so uh, I did what a lot of spouses did and I forgot about it and didn't do anything um, for two, three weeks. And uh, she sent me an article um, that was, uh, it was like what dumb spouses need to learn about in the kitchen. I was like, God, that's me. I'm, that's exactly what I need to be reading. So, so I read that. Uh, another article came where it was like seven essential tools that you need to have in the kitchen. And I was like, sweet, need those as well. So I went those, but then, uh, <laughs> then I went uh, to the key part of the buying process where right before our next meeting, my wife goes, so have you cooked? And I go, shit. I have not cooked at all. I did not. I go to that 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 where, where, for example, your boss, your CEO comes in and says, "Hey, did you do this?" And you're like, "Crap, where do I go?" You immediately go to something you trust. What's top of mind at that point? Well, you know what was top of mind in my mind at that moment? Plated. If you look at this article, the seven essential tools, plated. It was a piece of branded content that was educational, was thought leadership content coming from them. I immediately go there, found out what plated did, and I was like, "Man, this is awesome. They can ship this to my work. I can go home." and I can cook it, it's already pre-portioned so easy, and then ultimately I can throw it away at the bottom of the trash can and like take the trash out and so she really doesn't see it. And so like, yeah, I did it, for real. Trust circle right here, I did it. No, I, and, I, and I really did, um, you know, two, three weeks later I did tell you know, my wife I came clean and she's like, well yeah, I mean that's what I wanted you to do. And I was like, what? I was like, I thought I was being like sneaky cool and she's like, no, 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 like I was sending you articles from Bladed because I wanted you to, to sign up for the service. I'm like. That's amazing. So when you look at that content marketing example of she stayed on top of my mind in this natural educational way where when I was in that moment, I went to the place that she wanted. So who won there? Who's the ultimate winner? Plated won. They got the customer, right? And so, and actually everybody won. I won because I was a hero. My wife won because she influenced me and then Plated won. So that's the beauty of this whole top of mind. Like, do you understand that from a content marketing perspective, how I was, I, it came immediately at the right time? They had educated me in the right way and then I went directly to them. Does that make sense? Somebody had to point that out to me, like I didn't know, I was like, man, that's a good content marketing example. So here, my wife plus Yoda, what I call this top of mind content marketing strategy equals me. It's a legit picture of me cooking. Okay, so I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna probably have to shorten this up, but um, one of the key things, you know, I've talked about a lot of things you can do with trust, but one of the, um, and just yank me with a, with a something if I really go too long, but um, one of the big things with I'm an OT, okay, cool. All right, so doing the, the sh or going from short term to long term, that, that is, it's consistency. And the example that I give when I mean consistency is that when I was a si six years old, my sister made me sing the Cabbage Patch Kids and Baby Got Back very consistently in front of her friends, repetition. And I, I was also, I also received this engagement which made it really stand out in my mind. And I, and I said, you know, I don't know any song. If you ask me to sing any song right now, I can't sing them, except for these two songs. I'm terrible with words when it comes to songs. However, I do know these two because it was repetition, it stayed top of mind for a long time, and naturally it's in my long-term memory for life. I explained this logic to Paul Spiegelman, one of, uh, he's a best-selling author, and he goes, John, I wanna be the Cabbage Patch Kids to this audience when it comes to company culture. And I was like, that's hilarious. So basically what he wants to do is he goes, I want to naturally engage and get these people very consistently so that 10 years down the road, they're still thinking of me as culture just the way, same way you think about Cabbage Patch Kids. And um, I was like, that's actually a really good, like, and that's why I put it in here because I think that's a good m reminder of how important consistency is. No matter what it is, if you win, like my sister won by getting these things in my mind, so at family events, she'll still make me sing this stuff. So if you guys don't believe me, here we are, Raimi, stuck in this little gold mine, just sad as we can be, feels like a long, long time, and we left and played together, you and me. Do you want me to keep going? I know I'm OT, but um, I'm not gonna rap. So um, we're just gonna skip a few of these, but you know, what, what I'll end on is, um, 
actually, we'll just let this go. Ship my pants, you're kidding. You can ship your pants right here. You hear that? I can ship my pants for free. Wow, I just may ship my pants. Yeah, ship your pants. Billy, you can ship your pants too. I can't wait to ship my pants, Dad. I just shipped my pants and it's very convenient. Very convenient. I just shipped my drawers. I just shipped my nighty. I just shipped my bed. If you can't find what you're looking for in store, we'll find it at Kmart.com right now and ship it to you for free. Okay, so that's nothing to do with the speech. I just love it, um, the video. Now, it's, it's actually, it's a reminder. When I saw that video, it was a reminder of uh, that story that I, that I heard is that that didn't leave the, uh, the board uh, room at uh, Kmart. The executive said, we don't want this out of there, and it snuck out of there. And to me, I was like, that was the, probably one of the only times in 20 years that I feel super connected to Kmart. And I was, I, I like, was truly engaged. And a lot of times, you know, when we're talking about this top of mindset, mindset there, I've talked about you know, creating trust. I've talked about doing it consistently. But one of the key things that you have to remember is that sometimes it's okay to be different. Sometimes it's okay to be unique. When it comes to content, that's something I've learned is that there's so much of it out there these days, whether you're in, on the journal side, thought leadership, any form of content. So it is okay to be different and unique. And this is some of the examples that I'll end on right here is that these are, we embrace, like I, I practice what I preach. And if you look at some of my content, the one on the left is uh, about ridiculous ways we you know, improved our company culture. One has to do with the jar that I got from New Girl. So I admitted that one, I have a jar in my office that's from New Girl, and two, I watch New Girl a lot. So those are, once again, we're adding authenticity, but that's different. And a lot of people, we actually got three people apply that we ended up hiring from that, um, from that article. Uh, then on the other hand, you have uh, you know, an article in Content Marketing Institute which had a lot of data we had collected. You don't have to be creative and funny but we have data that nobody else has. We, we had 150 managing editors get this content to us and we were like, hey, we have this, we can really add value for other people. So when you look at that, that's also unique and different too, that we can offer people that others can't. And then also we stay ahead of uh, trends and we do a lot of the trends pieces in the Forbes, in the Inks uh, places, and we spend a lot of time learning about that and understanding them so people can trust us that we're going in the right direction. So what I'll end on is whether you're in a brand company, journalist, if you can differentiate yourself, add p value for people, you're gonna be a little more memorable. And uh, hopefully you had fun uh, today. So it was good being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you, John.